Yeah, maybe give you a minute after lunch. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We can give just a minute or two more, and then we'll get we'll get fired off here. Yeah. <laughs> Nice that we're the engine. Hello. That is working. Just in case. Give some water. I don't. Is this yours? Uh, and nobody's using that. I mean, there's a class, but I was just wondering if this was already something. There it might be. This is yours. Okay, I think I think we can probably go ahead and get started. Is that Mike picking up my voice? Is that I don't really need it, but I think if it is getting recorded, we're... great. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Al Smith. Um, I work for Dig Deep, and we're here to present our decentralized wastewater innovation cohort, um, the policy work that we did around that, and open up a discussion around wash and high income countries. This specific context is in the United States um, because that's where Big Deep does their work. Um, but we're uh, we think that these concepts do apply in other high income countries. And if anybody's from Canada or Europe, I really uh, love you all's input um, on some of the um, information that we're presenting here today. And so it's going to be a um, we're going to kind of talk up here briefly. Um, probably next 20 minutes or so will be presentations. You'll get to hear from me. I'll introduce um, the cohort. Um, our members will introduce themselves. You'll get to hear a, a presentation on the community perspectives and sanitation uh, given by the uh, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and by out of Hawaii uh, wastewater alternatives and innovations. Um, we'll have a, a video. And then after that, we're going to break out in the breakout groups spend about a half an hour doing some um, collaborative work on uh, some of the themes surrounding these uh, sanitation uh, challenges that we have here in the US. Uh, and then we'll come back together and do report outs at the end and can do question and answer and stuff like that. So um, yeah. great. So um, sanitation challenges in the, in the US. Um, Dig Deep is a humanitarian rights organization uh, focused on making sure, ensuring that every American citizen has safe access to sanitation and drinking water forever. And so one of the objectives is to identify key policy uh, items that can be addressed. And we did this through uh, participatory um, research research with a number of different NGOs. And so um, a few key points around this, and I don't know if, if anybody is aware, I only became aware in the last three years or so, but there are more than 2.2 million Americans who lack access to sanitation and drinking water access. Um, and race and poverty are the two leading predictors of access. Um, and myriad barriers exist um, a lack of data being one of them. So we don't have good information on who does and doesn't have access to sanitation here in the US. Um, there's, there are many funding gaps that are very challenging to overcome in these communities. And I think you'll start to understand why in a little bit once, uh, once David and Stuart have an opportunity to, uh, to discuss. Um, there are challenging geographies and changing regulations depending on what state or even what county um, or local government you're working under. And then there's a community cap capacity and human capital issue that needs to be overcome. So many of these communities that we are working in and that these other organizations across the country are working in, um, those communities don't have the, the resources, the, the labor force, the um, expertise to reach out for some of the programs that exist, although we need many more programs to, uh, to help assist these. Um, and we've had, um, you'll, you'll understand a little bit more about the cohort once we get into it, but effectively at a very high level, I won't get into all the details. We took five NGOs from across the country, um, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium, Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations, Big Deep Spray on Navajo Project, uh, Navajo Water Project, the Black Belt Unincorporated Wastewater mm -hmm. Program, and the New York 
State Center for Clean Water Technology. And the idea is to get all of these NGOs in the same room. And one of the key components of, the, of these NGOs um, were working on something innovative in the decentralized wastewater space. And so that could be uh, innovative technologies that they're implementing in their communities. It could be innovative funding strategies that they've identified and been able to access um, creative ways of navigating regulations to make sure that folks are, are able to get access. Um, and so we got all these folks into the same room while well, virtually speaking, because all of this happened through COVID. And we heard from them on what their challenges were on the ground, um, what policy changes could be made at the federal levels and then trickling down to the state levels um, and existing programs and emerging programs that could help um, these different funding and technical assistance resources reach these communities. Um, and then we took all that information and we compiled it into a policy brief, which we delivered um, virtually to uh, stakeholders in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. EPA and the USDA Rural Development. Um, and we actually were able to get in the room with some pretty high, high level folks. And um, we, at the end of it, felt like our voices were heard. We did see the needle move a little bit as we were um, at the end of uh, delivering our um, our findings. And one of the really interesting things that happened, and we didn't intend it this way, unless the, um, I mean, the CEO, George McGraw, Dick Deep is a, is a genius, and he was the one who wrote this grant and proposal. Uh, but I don't think any of us could have anticipated the massive infrastructure bill that was released this past year, the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so all of this kind of came together all at once. Um, and we were able to see a couple new programs uh, evolve out of the EPA. Um, most notice, noticeably, the Closing the Wastewater Gap Community Initiative, which is a technical assistance program and uh, new funding assistance program for these communities that we're discussing. Um, and then we also saw uh, some new environmental finance centers being funded and developed and even opened up to organizations who don't traditionally um, apply for and propose on those, um, those type of activities. Um, and uh, one of our big drivers is trying to include direct service provision into technical assistance programs. A lot of technical assistance programs available to communities in the United States are geared towards providing training and compliance assistance and those sorts of things. Um, but there's some new language in those programs that um, would allow for these technical assistance providers to act, actually implement projects and do engineering work and studies and um, help those communities access the available resources. <laughs> and um, so with that, I'm going to, that's that's the project, that's the, uh, the research we did. And we have representatives from uh, all but two of the uh, organizations who participated, and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves uh, before we um, get into the, um, the community perspectives presentation. So, um, Stuart, since you're first in line, do you want to sure. start off? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is, I should say, hi, y'all. I'm originally from the South. I live in Hawaii now. Uh, my name is Stuart Coleman, and I'm the executive director and co-founder of a group called VAI. It's W-A-I. Um, I just learned a new acronym yesterday. That's a backronym um, for uh, wastewater alternatives and innovation. We knew we wanted to use the word VAI, and we build it in from there. Mm -hmm. And so we um, are a nonprofit and we're focused on Hawaii's cesspool situation. Um, we have about 88,000 cesspools in Hawaii, which is something most people do not imagine when they think of the islands of Hawaii. It's not in many of the brochures that you'll find um, at the tourist uh, you know, destinations, but it's something that uh, you know I think brings us all together that we have to be aware of. And so we have um, five pilot programs, um, excuse me, five programs and are instituting pilot projects across Hawaii. Uh, and we focus on um, technical innovation first. Um, but like the, the uh, speaker said today before lunch, if you focus on the technology without you know, the people, um, that's most important to outreach and education um, is, is very important. And then if you have technology without getting them in the ground and showing how they work or don't work, um, that can be a real failure sometimes mm -hmm. we see. So we have pilot projects and uh, we do policy and adv advocacy work uh, as well. And so it's a pleasure to, to be with you here today. And we'll be talking a little bit more about what we do 
um, in a few minutes. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Susan Lamb. I also work for the organization Big Deep, but I'm a program officer with the NGO. And so I'm here with my colleagues, um, Al Smith, who opened for us, and also Abby Bradshaw. Um, and Abby, if you just before moving forward, just want to introduce yourself as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Abby Bradshaw. I'm a field engineer and project engineer. Uh, do a lot of everything at Appalachia Water Project, which is a project site at Dig Deep. Um, I live over there in the very far south, furthest southwest corner of West Virginia in a county called McDowell County, which was a <laughs> coal producing county. Um, it was second wealthiest county in the U.S. for, for a little while, and now it's probably around the second poorest per capita county in the U.S. Um, in my county, we estimate by recent estimates that we probably have about somewhere between 60 to 70 percent of people who are still straight piping their wastewater. Um, so we we live in a county with with a, a, a huge, huge layered issue of of wastewater and water management. And we are trying to trying to work in some of those solutions and really excited to talk to anyone um, about domestic wash and Excited. I'm not in the decentralized wastewater innovation cohort, but work for Dig Deep. So happy to be here with uh, with my colleagues to, to continue the conversation. Thank you, Abby. Um, and so also to kind of dive in a little bit more about Dig Deep, we actually started as an international wash organization uh, focusing on countries outside of the U.S. But upon realizing the inequities that we are encountering domestically, we actually shifted our entire operations and work to here, uh, work in the U.S. And so we currently have three regional projects. Um, one being the Nav on the Navajo Nation, which you've heard us talk about so far, um, rural Appalachia, where Abby works, and then also we have a new project um, in Texas, Mexico border communities called Colonias. And so in terms of our um, Navajo water project was the participant in this decentralized wastewater innovation cohort. Um, and on the Navajo Nation, we know that about 30% of people don't have access to running water, um, and many of those families also don't have access to basic sanitation services. So what our Navajo Water Project um, does, who's led by Navajo people, uh, Diné people, and I'm sorry that you're having to listen to me today rather than some of my wonderful Diné colleagues, to explain more about the, the project to you. Um, but we're working on innovative solutions for both water and wastewater um, to support communities in, in the Navajo Nation. Um, and so specifically thinking about wastewater, um, a lot of uh, traditional centralized sewer services often aren't currently feasible um, one, due to the geography of the region. So um, culturally and geographically, a lot of the homes on the Navajo Nation are very dispersed. And so because of that low density um, spread of households, <laughs> it makes centralized sewer systems uh, not, not a feasible option for many. Um, and then also, as, as many of you know, uh, the Navajo Nation has been historically and currently uh, underinvested in terms of funding um, from government funding opportunities that have been provided <laughs> much of the rest of the U.S., um, and so those are kind of current challenges that our, our, our team is facing and looking for um, wastewater options currently at the moment. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm David Beveridge. I'm the Senior Director for the Environmental Health and Engineering Team uh, for the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. Uh, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium was formed in 1997 as an act of Congress actually to carry out the statewide environmental health and engineering services and hospital uh, to oversee a hospital in Anchorage for the tribal health system. Uh, it was, uh, we currently serve 229 tribes across the state. Um, and we work with other tribal partners across the entire state to deliver these health services. Um, so we jointly operate a hospital. We have about 3,000 employees and uh, we have about 250 within the environmental health and engineering firm, uh, our, our, our division. But basically, we're trying to keep people out of the hospitals. So while we run a a tertiary care hospital. We also try to eliminate people from visiting hospitals. So I've, I've served for um, 30 years, just about 30 years in the U.S. Public Health Service uh, with, within the Indian Health Service. And um, I recently retired. Uh, my 20 years in Alaska were was uh, as an officer in the Public Health Service. And so prior to that, I was uh, I worked in Oklahoma, Washington, and in Idaho, providing water and sanitation services for tribes across the country there. And ANTHC in our division of environmental health and engineering, I consider us ourselves implementers. We have a staff that's very passionate about what we do. Our vision is Alaska Native. Alaska Native people are the healthiest people in the world. You can't do that when you're living in third world type of conditions with sanitation. So um, we work closely to um, identify needs in sanitation in the watch sector. 
uh, to get uh, funding to meet those needs and to actually carry out the design and construction of those projects, as well as assist communities in operating and maintaining those systems. So Alaska is a pretty big state. Um, I'm going to share a little bit more when I get up to talk about what that uh, landscape looks like. But I've seen since I've been here since the start of the conference that there's a lot of similarities, uh, really, even within Alaska and what we're seeing internationally with, with respect to the wash sector. So I'll be sharing more on that in, in my talk. So thank you. Great. Thank, thanks, everybody. Thanks for the introductions. And so we're going to show a short video. We did a, a little media promotional piece and that kind of, you know, lays out the problem a little bit visually more and more, more visually and more eloquently than I can, can do up here. So we're going to play that and then we will listen to our community voices presentations. So it's this is a large pond, 88 acres, but uh, the Hawaiians who were building fish ponds hundreds of years ago built them, you know, many times larger than this. And the whole point was to raise fish and seafood so that the people living on these islands could subsist off of them. So we're talking literally tens of thousands of pounds of fish uh, that supported, you know, uh, a neighborhood, a, a village, a community in this Ahupua'a. So it's all about the water, the quality of that water. Vive stands for uh, Wastewater Alternatives and Innovations. And Vive's mission is to restore healthy watersheds and reduce sewage pollution by converting to the mining. So most of North Shore, uh, the neighborhoods are right along the coast. Almost everyone is likely on accessible. And it's a really just a hole in the ground where all the wastewater from the household just goes into a hole and they have an open bottom. So all of the wastewater just kind of percolates right into the ground. All of the waste that goes into a cesspool essentially leaches into the surrounding environment. You need to get a septic tank upgrade. And especially since you guys are close to the water, it would be great if we can get you guys in a system that has like a nitrogen reducing capacity. You know, with 88,000 across the state, leaching, discharging 53 million gallons a day of unshaded sewage, that goes directly into our groundwater and can contaminate drinking water and then uh, coastal ecosystem. <clears throat> the native lions that were here, they knew that from ridge to reef, that everything is connected hydrologically. And so this is basic kind of indigenous knowledge that the Hawaiians had that we're really just now starting to really realize and uh, this is not only a massive problem in Hawaii but across the country. There's this whole subsect of the country, around 25%, who rely on what are called decentralized solutions. So these are remote communities where maybe you don't have electricity, maybe you don't have plumbing, where water comes out of the ground or out of a local watershed and goes right back where it came from. There's about 30 communities that do not have any type of piped water that's sort of in their community. It's going to take innovation to address everything from Alaska down all through the United States. It's just uh, not a well sized fits all solution. This week, Vi is hosting a group from the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. This is the Cinderella Incineration Equipment. The great thing is, as you can see, it's not connected to a water line or a sewer line. We need flexibility, creativity, willingness to look at new ideas and new ways of doing things, and really a paradigm shift about how do we think about wastewater. It's not just the burden of the homeowner or the problem of the homeowner that it can cost anywhere from 15 to 50,000 in Hawaii to replace these systems and the homeowners just don't have that right now. The grass loves to uptake all that water and therefore not only are we improving the quality but also the quantity of the wastewater. But we are able to achieve this for zero electricity in this nature-based system. You know, when you start to realize with problems as big as climate change or wastewater pollution, 
there's only so much that one person, one group, one state can do. The more that you can think about this is a ubiquitous problem, the more you can wrap your head around why it's important to solve it. Around the country, there are similarities in terms of we desperately need funding. We need more federal oversight on these things. There is a need to educate policymakers and also just educate and kind of open the doors of creativity. So it's exciting to try to move past describing the problem and work towards finding a solution. I think ultimately the outcome that I'm hoping for most is that communities and people get safe access to sanitation and that we can close this access gap that we have. Let's see if I can actually figure out how to navigate back to the PowerPoint. <laughs> You can't have a video that's filmed in Hawaii, by the way, without having some surfing scene at the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's mandatory. It's mandatory. Um, just turn on a There we go. Okay. And so as you, as you can see, um, it's a challenge across the entire U.S. And there were a couple of organizations who weren't able to participate with us today. The uh, Stony Brook University's New York Center for Clean Water Technology. Um, they're working on advanced and innovative systems um, in uh, Long Island um, that have actually, um, we're trying to adopt in Colorado and Part of the whole point of this research cohort is to try to work with the organizations who are doing things unique and bring that information um, to other parts of the, the U.S. And um, some of Stuart's work is, is based on that, which he'll go into. And then the Black Belt Unincorporated Wastewater Program, also not able to be here with us, but they're doing very important work in Black Belt communities in Alabama. And Kevin White, who was originally going to be here, but um, was called away for health issues, um, would... Uh, wanted me to share a success story um, of some of the work that they're doing there. And so um, the Black Belt Un Unincorporated Wastewater Program was established as a nonprofit in 2019. Um, and they had a goal to install and manage on-site wastewater systems in rural and underserved Alabama Black Belt communities where clay soils, um, highly impermeable, cause a lot of sanitation challenges there. Um, they were able to create a... Um, a program where residents could apply for an on-site system and they pay an upfront fee. Um, and then agree, agree to pay $20 a month maintenance fee that will use to be used to maintain and repair those systems. And so they were able to work with the regulators and the regulators were able to give them a um, potentially a, a, a smaller footprint system if they had some advanced technology um, and they were uh, proving that they were properly operating and maintaining that program as a collaboration with the um, with the Health and Environmental uh, Protection Department in Alabama as well. Um, it was initially set up with USDA funds. Um, and they were given two point two million dollars, and they've already installed um, one uh, hundred and fifty systems with the goal of installing three hundred. And so these are the type of wins that we're looking for in the work that we're doing. I think it's really powerful that we have um, folks like the Black Belt Incorporated Wastewater Program kind of paving the way for, for others to, to do the same. And so um, with that, we're going to get to our Community Voices presentations. And so um, Stuart, I believe you're going first, and so I can turn it over to you. Sure. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Al. And, you know, I, I think it's really important, especially in light of what we were talking today, we were talking at lunch, you know, that sometimes we we think this is a, a developing world issue and, and we forget that, you know, we have these own conditions in our own country. And we, I first met um, some of our innovative tech partners that we work with uh, at the Gates Foundation's Reinvented Toilet Expo four years ago in Beijing wearing a tape um, and, and a couple of people here. And it's one of these conferences, you're like, how did I end up here? I did not expect this in my future to be in Beijing. And 
we thought we were going to be on a small little panel and we were the closing speech and we had no idea why we we're like oh my god they put us as a closing speech and it was because when you think of hawaii does anyone think of cesspools no and he the director was very smart and he thought let's take what some people think of this beautiful paradise and let's remind people that this is a global issue issue an international issue that we all face and sometimes you know, we're going out and telling, oh, this is what you should do when we're not taking care of our, tending to our own issues. So I really appreciate the work that Dig Deep has done and, and reminding people that this is a human rights issue. Um, and just so uh, people know here, I think everybody in the audience knows, but apparently a good percentage of the people, kids in the United States, think that Hawaii and Alaska are below the border. <laughs> so yeah, because it put on so many maps that way. Uh, we were actually the most isolated uh, land uh, mass state of islands in the world. And we have, um, as was mentioned, 88,000 um, cesspools. Thank you. And uh, so what part of what Dig Deep was did was bring these groups together that represent not only geographically diverse places, but um, diverse populations as well, and indigenous groups. So we were paired up with um, Stony Brook University and their Center for Clean Water Technology. And it turned out to be a really perfect fit because this is probably something else you didn't know. What is the place that has more set pools than in volume than any other state in the country? New York, Long Island, Suffolk County, where you think they would have stringent regulations about this stuff, right? Um, they have by volume the most. They have 250,000 cesspools, and, uh, which is incredible to think about. And we have 88,000. We have the most per capita, but they have the most by volume. And we end up visiting them and really you know, visiting the Shinnecock Nation, the Native um, people that live there. And it, it was really illuminating because, you know, in Hawaii, we're lucky in that we're surrounded by ocean water, so there are a lot of currents, right? Um, when these 53 million gallons a day of untreated waste are going into these cesspools and going into the groundwater and out into the ocean, we have a lot of current. Um, but we have also big embayments that, where there's not a lot of current. And I used to go, when I was a kid, clamming in the Long Island Sound and in the Bay, and it was, it was a generational old industry. It has collapsed completely. 99% due to wastewater pollution from these cesspools um, and failing septic systems. So you talk about real world problems. I mean, these are very severe. It's, it's kind of ruined an industry um, cost. You can imagine the hundreds of millions with you know, tourism. They have harmful algal blooms. And then this is the most important thing. They have the most elevated nitrogen rates in their drinking water in the entire country. Like them, Hawaii is also dependent on our own aquifers for our source of water supply. And so they, along with those, are seeing elevated rates of cancer, certain types of cancer, like bladder cancer. Um, and so it's very much a, a human rights issue, but it's also a public health issue. Um, and so that was really kind of um, disturbing to find out. But I asked them when I was there, I said, do you mind if I take this story and use you, you all as you know a cautionary tale? And I was thinking that's kind of a lot to ask. You know, <laughs> tourism industry is not going to like it. And they're like, no, by all means, you have to. And so I just published a couple of articles, and you basically said Hawaii's dirty secret. You know, which again, the tourism industry is not excited about that. Um, and then uh, a cautionary tale for Hawaii. Um, about we have to really think about what are the consequences of this environmentally, public health wise, um, and such. And then we have native populations that you know um, don't have running water or electricity, um, and they're on cesspools as well. So it's been amazing to work with our colleagues across the country and really bring this awareness to um, the situation here, but also very exciting because. Each of the groups has really cool pilot projects. As you saw in that video, we have the incineration toilet that we introduced not only to Hawaii, but for most of the United States, the Cinderella incineration toilet. And of all the things I talk about, the things that my family and friends want to know the most, incineration toilet, tell me about that. What, two words you'd never expect to go together, but um, it's exciting when you're doing 
new pilot projects that are the first to be done and introducing whole completely new technologies. Um, but thank you all. Thank you. I want to thank Stuart for uh, correcting people on the geography here. Um, <laughs> but I do want to say one other thing the scale's off too. So, how many people have been to Alaska before? Yeah. All right. So, um, everybody else has watched TV and they have a reality perception that's not really reality. But anyway, when you look at Alaska and you go from Southeast Alaska here, you could put that basically on Georgia and you can take the Aleutians put that on Nevada and then up at the top you're up into the Dakotas and so it basically flatters almost the whole U.S. so you can see there where one size uh, approach is not not good everything in Africa <laughs> but I wanted to um I don't know if I'm going to do it justice um you know to try and in five or six minutes to give an overview of Alaska but I'll, I'll do my best so um from a perspective of the number of communities that we work with we work with about 180 native communities all scattered throughout the, the map. And most of these communities are situated along rivers and coasts. And because that's just where the, they settled, that's where they were. And schools got built on the river or as far up as the barge went, that's where the community is, was established. And, uh, and, and so it's very isolated. To get to most of these communities, you have to either fly in and uh, land on the airport, there's landing strip with gravel, or you take a barge or a boat you know, into the community. Each community is really its own uh, island uh, in a way. Uh, it, it is not connected by roads. It's not connected electrically. So each community has its own power generation plants. Uh, most communities have a health care center. Um, these communities are anywhere from the average community might be 250 people, 200 to 250 people. And they'll have a small clinic. They might see a doctor um, twice a year coming to the community or a dentist twice a year. Some some have higher level of service. As far as from an engineering perspective, uh, you're trying to design things for extreme temperatures in the interior of Alaska can get up into the 90s in the summer and minus 60 in the winter. So you're trying to design for 150 degrees swing in temperature. Uh, the culture is a subsistence culture. So people um, gather their food, they're gatherers, hunters. And uh, and so that's that's extremely important uh, with, with in the Alaska Native communities. Very low, low, very low income in a lot of communities. I mean, contrary to the idea that there's a lot of money and we get our oil money, you know, we get a couple thousand dollars a year. If you can endure all that um, in the winters, <laughs> you get rewarded with a little bit of income, but it, it's nothing compared to what it actually costs to live in rural Alaska. I've seen, I've seen a, a gallon of water cost more than a gallon of gas in these villages. And so just to bring in food and everything is very expensive. A lot of communities are faced with environmental threats, of permafrost degradation, uh, flooding, and erosion. And so they're constantly having to deal with that. At least 144 communities that we work with are environmentally threatened. And, uh, and uh, a lot of communities face uh, still trauma from generations of, of, uh, of just the way that they've been uh, treated and, um, and colonialism and things like that. There's a lot of things to work through in Alaska as we try and carry out projects. I want to talk about the level of service that, that communities uh, experience with respect to water and sewer. So a lot of communities have been fully piped for decades, and so they're starting to age already. You're already we're talking about trying to replace systems, but we still haven't built systems for um, communities yet. Some communities have wells and septics, and they work pretty well, but contrary to the idea that Alaska must have all this pristine water, it's also very mineral, mineral rich. A lot of arsenic and metals in water, and it's 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 not the best water in, in many many communities. We have about 17 communities that actually have a managed haul system where water is brought to a house and put in a tank, and then wastewater is all out of the house in a way. And we still have about 30 communities without uh, water at all, uh, as I mentioned in that video there. So they lack household plumbing. So health statistic wise, how can we? How can Alaska Native people be the healthiest people in the world when, when, when we don't have running water in the homes? Uh, we did a study with CDC back in 2008 that showed that infants are hospitalized a lot more in communities with um, without running water compared to the rest of the uh, country and places that actually have running water. Uh, their um, infants are one third likely to be hospitalized as a result of this in the community. Uh, they're 11 times more likely to be hospitalized due to pneumonia and five, five times more likely to be hospitalized due to lower respiratory tract infections with communities 
that actually have pipe water disorder. And so we just compared community to community data. I mean, it, this is it's a just it's it's good data. And we're making progress, but I want to talk about what an unserved location might be like. So this is again where you have homes without running water. And what you have in most of those is you have a wash interior, a central building that's in a community, and there's safe water that's treated and, and available for people to come and collect it and take it back to their houses. And they'll do that, you know, in in, in the winter, 50 below on their sleds and on their snow machines and things like that. So they'll bring water in the house, store it in buckets or in, in garbage pails and and use that. And they'll have a, a most homes in those communities will have a little basin that's in the sink. Now a faucet that was put in when the house was built, but there's nothing ever coming out of that faucet. It's been 20 years or more. And so they'll put a basin in there and that's what they'll use to hand wash uh, over and over again. And so they don't, it's water scarce, so you don't flow the water out. You keep using the same water over and over again. So definitely some serious health, environmental health issues there. On the waste side, uh, it's even nastier. Um, so honey buckets, I don't know how that ever got the word honey bucket, but if you <laughs> don't know what a honey bucket is, it's basically a five-gallon pail that you would get you know, at, a, at a Lowe's or Home Depot. You put the Costco-type bag in there, and you put a toilet seat on it, and that's where you go to the bathroom in your house. And so you can imagine the uh, things like odor and everything like that that you're going to have in a house. <clears throat> There's just an inability to clean yourself. There's an inability to wash your hands. COVID really highlighted that. Um, you know, we all the directions that were coming out from everybody was to separate out, keep your distance. It's already overcrowded in Alaska. Wash your hands and keep things clean. Well, that, you know, that's impossible for some of those the homeowners. Uh, and so, you know, that's that's the current condition that we're at right now. We're making some progress. Uh, several years ago, we we really thought, well, we can't just not do anything. So. We started, uh, we designed a system for a community uh, in Kibalina, which was going to relocate eventually. But because it was threatened and they were going to move, the government never invested really any serious money into water and sewer into the community because why put a pipe system in when the community's going to leave? So we created a system called a PASS unit, uh, and it's a portable alternative sanitation system. And it basically was just a, it, it's a, a way to collect water from a roof, uh, like in Kibalina where it rains a lot, and, and bring it in and treat it in their house, put it into a tank, and actually let it gravity feed to a, a faucet where people could now wash hands. Uh, and then in that, in those cases, we also put separating toilets in that would, we would ventilate, the, well, we would basically let the, um, the, do the separating and then the liquid side would go down into the soil. So you can't necessarily do that in a frozen soil, but in some communities you can actually do that. So that was a great community residents loved that. I went to a house with six children and the mom was excited. It was a game changer for them. But uh, we can't put a system like that into everywhere. So we worked a lot with some private uh, partners uh, and created a mini pass unit, which was a hand washing station that would go into a house, much smaller scale. And you bring your own water in somehow, but you would also do a, uh, you would put water into the tanks and you would have to have a faucet. But the big difference in that mini pass unit was instead of having a honey bucket, we actually ventilated a honey bucket. It's it's nothing crazy scientific or you know like academic. It's just let's just ventilate the honey bucket and dry it out and get the odor out of the house. And so that has just you know, been a game changer as well. But we got um, it was over two million dollars from the CDC Foundation during COVID. They wanted to do something immediately that would help. So. Uh, and since then, they've given us more money, and other regional partners have actually put up their own money to get these units mm -hmm. in. But I think we we put in 365 of these mini pass units and over 100 pass units. And I know that Olivia here is, is still volunteering her time for some of the studies on the pass units. So I thank you for that. Um, so that's that's really good news. Uh, now, on a, one of the reasons you might ask why haven't you know it's the U.S. why has not everything been done already? Well, these are really challenging communities now to put pipe water and sewer in, and they're very, very expensive. And so um, recently with the passing of the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, um, we received through the Indian Health Service is getting three and a half billion dollars over the next five years to address uh, the water gap across the country. And Alaska should receive a lot, a big portion of that, but it's going to take years to build these systems. It takes, you know, a couple years to design and short construction seasons. And it's crazy in Alaska that you would think, uh, okay, you've got maybe a six-month summer window, but in some places you have to construct in the winter when the ground's frozen. 
And now that with warming temperatures, we don't have that ability to spend that much. We don't have that much construction season in the winter either, so it's getting harder. But the, the big thing that still remains is operations and maintenance and the cost. So the same thing that I'm hearing here at this conference is the same in Alaska. Uh, but I just want to mention a couple of things that we're doing. Um, we're working really heavily on reducing the cost of water and sewer. For some homes, it's $250 a month for water and sewer. Uh, I don't know anywhere in the country that would pay that much uh, any, at any income levels. But yet people will pay that because it's important. So there is a willingness. But sometimes there's just not that ability, you know, when you have to choose between eating and what you eat and then if you're going to pay for water and sewer. So um, another thing is expanding um, our, the, a service provider role. Uh, I've never looked at it like that, but that's what I've heard in the conference. But uh, developing utility cooperatives and that to help communities have a network that, um, to run their systems. And then one thing I want to mention, that virtual operator training has just been tremendous. COVID kind of made us go out of the classroom virtual. We had an uh, average of a 7 to a 9% pass rate on a certification exam, uh, which was in class. When we took it virtual over 15 days, uh, the pass rate has now gone up to almost eight by 80%, so a tenfold increase by just delivering it in a different method. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, remote monitoring. I know some in, in uh, overseas are working on a monitoring system. So installing remote monitoring in the plant is really helping in the sustainability where we can identify issues that are happening ahead of time. Uh, so anyway, these, these are the things that we're moving to help our communities uh, move uh, to pipes and helping communities that already have pipes be more sustainable. Thank you. Okay. So what, what we're going to do now is we're going to break out into four breakout groups. And so this is going to be participatory. Um, and we're going to talk about some, some, some capacities related to, to the challenges that we're facing. And, you know, some of the, some of the obvious ones like data gaps and funding and those kinds of things um, relate to these. But those since those are a little bit more obvious, we're going to um, try to do a SWOT analysis on four emerging themes that um from these topics and or from these discussions and those are um public health framing uh messaging and storytelling community input and sanitation management and so each one of us is going to be leading a group discussion around what are the strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats that exist around these capacities that underlie all the work that we're doing um, and impact how, you know, the visibility of our projects and, you know, how policies are, are laid out and how we relate to this concept of underserved communities here in a high income country situation. So um, feel free to choose which one. You don't have to do one that's right next to you. Feel free to choose one. Um, and then we'll spend the next 20 or 30 minutes doing that. And then we'll have a report out and a brief discussion before, uh, before closing up. So... Go ahead and uh, find a topic of your choosing. Are you ready? <laughs> okay, we can see that during the meeting for now. Hey, I wonder if we, we can rearrange chairs as well. We don't want to have to do this. Thanks for the the audience. Yeah. So, 
Thank you for joining me here. And uh, before we start, I think it be really important to share perspectives on questions about
So this this point of like this maybe like permanent change. I mean climate change but also the political you know climate is getting it's in like water and it's gonna take on about the world. I wonder so far past the inception of that intervention that we no longer think about it on a day to day it's like Thank you. 
Unlimited working with some environmental groups, I mean, they have done good alliances, you know, and it's like you can find common ground. So, so
Oh, okay. I see. I mean, is there a lot of Four to five minutes, then we'll be around the uh, breakout group part. You guys want to hear a story?
So we're we're going to kind of wind down and start doing report outs from what everybody um, was able to uh, to put together here. So community input's going to go first. Thank you. 
see the sanitation management is meant to um, fill the entire board. Okay, so we have a lot to talk about, and I run a lot of really great ideas because sanitation management is going to be, it is a huge issue and will continue to be a huge issue. Um, so starting with our strengths, I won't go through everything, but so our government does have the money, it just is not allocated necessarily into maybe what it should be allocated into. Um, and so that, you know, can be one strength. We do have money that exists and we do have capacity that exists, but we just maybe aren't putting it into that place yet. Um, in a lot of communities, there is knowledge that, a knowledge of where the problems exist, you know, specifically in your community, people will say, yeah, I know over here in our town, we only have straight pipes or we have this kind of system. So people are very aware of what, oftentimes of what the issues are in their community and can tell you about it. Um, we, in the U.S., we do have a system of existing laws and frameworks in some communities that can govern things like um, on-site wastewater treatment systems or even just centralized wastewater treatment. And so we do have frameworks that we can start to build off of, but again, they might not always be sufficient enough yet. Um, we did regulatory enforcement. It, you know, sometimes can work, but there is again a framework for potential regulatory enforcement that could be up. Um, and then human resource and labor, and we talked about this sort of in comparison to uh, to international too. At least we know that there are some lacking labor protections in the U.S., but a lot of times people do do at least have have a bit more of a stable stable employment stable uh, protection. A bit, bit more of you know, um, kind of OSHA protection, better, better protective gear, things like that. So those were our strengths. Um, weaknesses was the rural versus the urban divide, and not only just density of people, density of locations, also the knowledge gap. So there's a lot more studies being done about. There's a lot more information about these dense urban areas as compared to the rural areas. Um, aging infrastructure is a huge one. We have a lot of infrastructure that does exist in the U.S. that at this point is maybe halfway functioning or not functioning at all. And so that presents a huge, huge issue as we move into the next decades because a lot of people who are maybe currently even being served might drop off of that category of being served. Um, Visibility and best practices, a lot of people just don't know that this is an issue. I think I didn't really know that this was a huge issue probably until a few years ago, and every day I find out more people that this issue is impacting. Um, budget for operations and maintenance, there is most, a lot of government funding won't support operations and maintenance. People do not have, a lot of people who I work for, work with, do not have money to do operations and maintenance on their own systems. and um, and then that will lead to system failing further down the line. Um, and user education, we aren't making sure that people know how to use their systems and know how to maintain them. Um, moving on to our opportunities, we have a lot of funders, a lot of politicians, and everyone in this room who is learning about this issue. And finally, I think we're reaching a point where people in our industry are talking about it, people are starting to know about it. And so that creates a situation where all of us can then go to our communities, to our institutions and say, this is an issue that's happening and here's what we should do about it. Let's do a project. Let's you know do all of these things. Let's start thinking about it more. We have a lot of open data. We have a lot of GIS that, you know, GIS data, open data that has a really strong potential for us to, to share data with each other to say, hey, I collected this, you can use it. So this community doesn't have to have any cost for collecting more data. So we have a strong online ability to be sharing different data. We have technical assistance providers who are able to do this work and can engage, but we do need to train them more. Probably we need to gain more of those in more communities, pay people better probably, things like that. We have a lot of exciting new research into green infrastructure, into sustainability, into ways that we can look at these problems. A lot of people who are really excited about that. Um, and then we do have a sense of urgency that might not have existed a few years ago. Um, 
because people are aware of climate change. And then lastly, over quick, threats, biggest one, climate change. I think we have people all over who are being threatened by floods, droughts, uh, all different, many different things in the United States that are threatening us. Um, then trust in federal government or local government organizations, depending on where you're at. People have bad experiences with, with those organizations in the past. Um, and sometimes the political environment just doesn't allow you to, to approach these issues. Um, saltwater intrusion, water scarcity, emerging contaminants, nutrient loading, all of these things that sort of at the end of the day mostly go back to climate change. Um, so I know that everyone in this room is really excited about continuing to think about think about these issues with us and help us work on more solutions. Thanks. Thank you. You did a great job. I don't know if this is thing. I've never known. Okay. Um, our group um, was talking about storytelling. Um, and just one before it again, so you don't think any of these ideas are my own. Um, I want to thank uh, Joe and Patrick and Rita and Carl and Christy um, and Rhea and Camille for helping us put, put together these ideas. Um, we're going to probably be bouncing a lot off of what was said earlier because it was so good. but. Um, you know, in terms of uh, strengths, we we really feel that like story, this is an opportunity for storytelling. Um, and we mentioned uh, talking about uh, the New York Times writer who I think you all know who as soon as I say it, I can't remember his name. He talked about if there are a million people are starving in a certain part of Africa, it's an article that doesn't get a lot of attention. If you talk about one person starving, yeah. Um, it changes everything because you humanize the problem, right? Um, does anybody know what writer I'm talking about? One of their editorials? Um, <laughs> huh? Nicholas Christoph. Uh, Nicholas, thank you. Nicholas Christoph. Thank you. I want to make credit him. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, these are issues that need storytelling. Um, and so, you know, some of the, the weaknesses is that um, it impacts all states. And so um, one of our group mentioned that how many people saw the 60 minutes special on Alabama um, in the black belt and the sanitation problem there. Um, now, what did you walk away with that story? This is a problem in poor rural Alabama. This is not my problem. Mm -hmm. And Rhea pointed out, this is a problem in every single state. She works with Habitat for Humanity in every place. They have some of these issues. Now, as a journalist, I would have said, a much better story to end that on would universalize it, right? Yeah. Instead of just saying this is poor, oh yeah, we expect that, you know, there. It's like, no, this is in every you know part of the United States. So that's an opportunity um, for greater awareness. Um, we talked about the pandemic, which I refer to as the great unveiling, you know, as while we were putting on masks, we were seeing systemic um, inequities, right? Things that were for uh, a lot of Americans, maybe everyone in this room knew about, but most Americans did not know about, you know, the, the levels of poverty, of racism, of disadvantaged communities that have been historically neglected. So this is an opportunity to really tell that story, make it more unifying, um, and, you know, make that kind of um, post-COVID reflection that this affects all of us. Um, because we talked about, you know, another thing Carl mentioned is, you know, technology. If we had the money and the technology, could we solve all these problems across every state? What do you think? We do have the money and we do have the technology. Are we solving it? No. What do we lack? Huh? Motivation. Motivation, political will, right? But now we have a historic opportunity with more federal funding that's ever been given to these issues. Where if you do a Google search, you know, on wastewater issues, you know, four years ago and now, the amount of times you'll see, you know, it go up, and I don't have it right in front of me, is it's just tremendous. I mean, there has been a level of heightened awareness, thanks partly to the WASH programs, you know, here and around the world. So this is an opportunity. And the threat is, are we going to let, are we going to waste this crisis? That's what the politicians say. Yeah. Let's not waste this crisis of a pandemic where we saw so much and it was unveiled and we just went back to business as usual. 
because that would be the greatest tragedy of all uh, on top of everything that we went through. Um, and so, you know, in terms of threats, we're dealing with like several taboos here, right? Not only do we have, you know, I started a conference in Hawaii and I said, you know, the, the, the two number one reasons why we have to tackle these issues are number one and number two. And there's a pause there, <laughs> much like this. <laughs> um, we're talking about something that people aren't comfortable talking about, right? Who would it be? Except everybody in this room, and you're clearly fascinated by it. Um, so, like all of us. Um, but for the rest of the country and the world, that's something that we really have to work on to really say, hey, it's not a taboo topic. This is something that's universal, has to do with environmental issues, health issues, social, economic. Um, so we have to really kind of normalize it. Um, and, you know, we have, even though, to Carl's point, we've been working in some ways on the same existing technology in many states for 50 to 100 years, right? And that's why our sewer systems are in such bad condition. And then we just historically, like you were saying, in the rural versus urban divide, we're like, oh, that's their issue. What we have to remind people in our storytelling is you might not have a cesspool and you might not think this is your business. Do you like going in the ocean and do you like clean water? Um, because these things threaten those things and public health. So again, just making sure that it's not just a single story that affects certain people, but universal. Um, and, uh, you know, in that telling that we talked about, you know, the opportunity is to, you know, unify um, these people, you know, make kind of sanitation issues, something we can talk about, but then it's also, and we talked about the story and the numbers, making sure you have stories to go with your data because basically folks, we are tend to be academics, right? And we tend to live in our heads and we speak in acronyms. The general public does not understand those acronyms, nor do they, do they really relate to them at all. So it's, con it's really important to constantly remember that we've got, you can have all the knowledge and the data, but if you're not translating that into human stories and how it affects everyone, we're not doing our jobs and we're not gonna see a major difference. Um, but all in all, I do think the opportunities right now at this point in history are on our, in our favor because of the increased federal funding, because of the heightened awareness that you see in the media, the increased storytelling, um, and because of post-COVID revelations um, about our society, I think now is a great time to be here. And that's why it's exciting. it's exciting to be here with you guys. So mahalo. Okay, great. That leaves me with three minutes. Um, so, oh no, no worries. I'm gonna I'll go through ours ours pretty quickly. These have all been incredible, and I'm glad that y'all had opportunity to to dive into such depth. Um, and then we can um, we can stick around for a little while after anybody wants to entertain questions. Otherwise, folks can get on with their their uh, their time. So public health framing, and this this is the idea that um, in order, and I think that this kind of goes along with the storytelling and messaging aspects, or at least piggybacks off of it, um, is that we need to frame our our attitudes, the way we talk about it, differently. Um, I'm an engineer and I'm an operator, and I talk about public. I talk about water and wastewater, or my community talks about water and wastewater in terms of um, a lot of it is environmental protection, at least wastewater. Water has a much stronger public health framing. So um, I think changing that that context is really important. So some of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats we um, have identified. Um, I'll go through some of the highlights here. So um, it was brought up that we have a rich history of infrastructure and public health in the United States. Back in the early part of last century, we had these incredible infrastructure projects that provided clean drinking water and provided access to wastewater services and reduced things like typhoid and cholera and, and serious public health issues. So we, we have that history that we can lean on. We just need to bring it back into everybody's, everybody's minds and bring visibility back to it. Um, and then there are a lot of lessons learned from public health um, interventions in public health framing from low middle income countries and the international wash community 
And so one thing that Big Deep is very keen to do, and I think we should all be thinking about if we're working here in the US, is how do we bring those lessons learned home and implement them here? Because there's a really robust WASH community out in the international environment, um, and there's a lot for us to learn here. And then um, some weaknesses are, there's really no public agreement on sanitation as you know, public health bring in no agreement on you know, addressing it as such. And so if we could all get kind of consensus, um, that would help the issue as well. Um, there's no consistent way to translate um, water pollution and sanitation into economic benefits. Um, actually, Dig Deep, I have some uh, reports to give away over there from Dig Deep on our economic impact study that dives into this a little bit, but we don't have consistent metrics on how to identify those things. Um, and there's less funding available for researching public health outcomes uh, than there are other, um, other topics within the sanitation sphere. Um, and then, so opportunities. So uh, Stuart, I like that y'all came up with the pandemic as an opportunity because we landed there as well. We have, it has been the unveiling that you mentioned and so we need to be able to use that to bring visibility to this issue. Um, and then let's see, packaging intervention, public health interventions together um, could be a strong way to get these um, uh, sanitation strategies or sanitation interventions in place, uh, much like the, I think somebody mentioned um, affordable housing and having sanitation type of that. Um, and then some of our threats, um, so that one, it's not sexy. So that's a huge threat. Like, us, like Stuart mentioned, aside from us, room, most people don't talk about this stuff on an ad nauseum basis. Um, and then we want to avoid any of our in interventions in as you know, house of public health interventions. We don't want that to lead to any further marginalization. So um, that's it in a nutshell. And we are at time, so I'll let everybody go. And yeah, if I can add just one thing, we were having drinks last night and uh, part of the Toilet Tuesday um, group that meets here, and we came up with uh, a tagline that I think we should all use, that, that we're making sanitation sexy again. So, <laughs> it's questionable, but let's do that. <laughs> take, take, care of this, uh, take advantage of something, too. Feel, feel free to check out our reports and make a copy uh, as they're available. <laughs> Born out of Emory University, actually, in Atlanta, and then we actually focus on like public health data and lowering the barrier. Something we think. So, yeah, I'd love to talk. Oh my goodness, I I do not have any cards on me, but I would love to write more contact information. That would be great. Really cool it's really fun having everybody's input. So, grab one. I don't have enough for everybody. So, Okay, my handwriting is terrible, yeah. but it's Al at DignityWater.org. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Thanks. It was so great meeting. Yeah, I just want to say hi. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kelly. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm working with uh, Natalie Exum and Rince Lee. Everybody is in the nomination part of JD. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so you're integrating with the Big Deep community already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. Good job. Yeah, thank you. I 
I don't want to Did you already take pictures of the whiteboard? Yeah. Okay. That's I think it was uh, Taylor. I got it slack. It was Taylor. It's on slack. Yeah. Oh, it's not a happy easy. We're coming to our presentation. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Thank you. It was fun. I feel like everyone looked really anxious for the game. Like all the great Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a real deal and it's a thing happening. So, yeah, uh, I just put the team together. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.